I've entitled our conversation today, Legacy Christians. Legacy Christians. And I want to propose to you that contained in the Easter story that we're going to look at together here in Luke chapter 24 are sort of four behaviors that you and I would be wise to emulate if we want to grow in our relationship with God. And so if you have your Bible, whether it's in paper like this or digital form, you know, on your mobile app, which Beto told you to put down, you know, you can certainly use it today for scripture. Uh, Follow along, try to picture the scene in your mind as always, and uh, let's see what God has to say to us today in the Easter story. Luke 24. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's stop here for a second. You know, when we read the stories of the life of Jesus in the Bible, one of the things that we can see demonstratively highlighted or characterized as we see showcased here in these first few verses is how Jesus valued women. You know, it's interesting when you, in the time period that Jesus lived, most of you know this, it's women were at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, In the time period that Jesus lived, men uh, ruled the the land within the Jewish kind of church context. Advanced education was largely limited to young boys and men. In public uh, settings, women were expected to be silent. You know, they were expected to kind of carry on the traditional roles of of cooking and cleaning and having babies. And so when Jesus uh, came along on the scene and when we study his ministry, we can see how he can... uh, he began to sort of liberate, if you will, uh, the role of women uh, back in, in those days. Not only do were they present throughout his ministry, but they also played a significant role in the early church sort of uh, beginnings. And so when we look here at verse 3, verses 1, 2, and 3, we, can, we read how this group of women are among those who were first at the Jesus first to discover Jesus's uh, empty tomb and and it's this group of women who received sort of what I would call this legacy changing information that Jesus has risen from the dead. And so what I want you all of us to sort of grasp today is that the a relationship with Jesus will change the trajectory of your life. And some of us, most of us, many of us have experienced that to be true. So let's go and look at this story. So very early on Sunday morning, this group of kind of changed women, this liberated women, they go to the tomb taking spices they had prepared, verse 2. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and they bowed their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again the third day. Stop here. Now write this down, point number one, in your app notes. Legacy Christians seek and explore. Legacy Christians seek and explore. You know, sisters and brothers, I want to applaud those of you who are here today and for those of you who are tuning in online for practicing this legacy truth. You know, here in our Easter story, we can read how a few of Jesus' female disciples are the first to seek and explore Jesus' empty tomb, thereby modeling for us that the Christian life is a life of seeking. The Christian life is a life of exploring. The Christian life, legacy Christians we see here, early church followers of Jesus, they seek and explore. And so if you're here today or you're tuning in online and and you recognize that maybe you're still trying to figure out who Jesus is and how that's supposed to be applied in your life, I just want to uh, commend you and affirm you for for being a part of the conversation. Because if we're going to grow in our understanding of who our creator God is, why he's created us, what our purpose in life is, how we're supposed to live amongst, you know, uh, our fellow humankind, 
then being a part of a conversation like this, seeking and exploring is a necessity for personal spiritual growth. And so the Bible writer tells us here, describes really here, how these women go to the tomb, they're, they're carrying these spices, which suggests to us, it tells us, it informs us that these women are expecting to find Jesus' dead body, and with these spices, according to the Jewish religion customs, the kind of the death ceremony of, if you will, they intend to anoint his body with it. Now, interestingly enough, a side note, if you read the Gospel of John, you'll read how uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was this businessman, and Nicodemus, who was this Pharisee, this religious leader, they had secretly gone to Pilate, and they asked for Jesus' body, and they, they, they took it down, and the Bible tells us that they are, had already anointed Jesus' body with 75 pounds of, of kind of ointment and oils, and, and it's in Joseph's tomb that Jesus was originally buried. But what that tells me is that these women, the fact that they go to the tomb with spices, they have no idea what Joseph and, and, and Nicodemus has already done. And so it just sort of, to me, at least frames the chaosness of what was happening in, in their midst. And so they go to this tomb. They're going to anoint Jesus' body. At least that's their hope with these spices. But instead of finding Jesus' dead body, what do they find? They encounter two men in dazzling robes, who angels, right? Who tell them that Jesus is what? Verse 5, if the angels ask, look at it. It says, why are you looking in a tomb for someone who is alive? Jesus isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Would you agree with me when I suggest that this is what we could call a legacy moment for these women? Their lives will never again be the same as a result of this newfound information. You know, the angels say, remember what Jesus said. Remember how Jesus promised that he would come back. Yes, Jesus was dead. Yes, you saw him die. Yes, you likely witnessed his body being taken down from the cross and maybe even put in this tomb with the tomb covering clothes, right? The, the door shut, if you will. But ladies, the tomb is now open. I can see the angels kind of flapping their wings and clapping their hands going, Jesus, ladies, are you with me? Wake up, everybody. He's, he's not here. He's alive. That's what these angels were saying. Jesus is risen. Friends, put yourself in these ladies' sandals, if you will. How would you have responded had you been in their situation? How would you have responded had you been there that morning at the empty tomb? Well, let's see what they did. Look at verse 8. Then they remembered that Jesus had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. Now write this down, point number two. Legacy Christians personalize... In community. Legacy Christians personalize in community. Brothers and sisters, the Christian life is a life of learning, which results or comes about as a result of seeking and exploring. Learning, I'm suggesting, is a personal pursuit. Learning grows out of a personal commitment and a thirst. But I also propose that learning flourishes in community. Would you turn to your neighbor and say to them, I need you? Turn to the person sitting next to you and just say, I need you. Spiritual maturation flourishes in community. In fact, everybody kind of just do that. In community. Just come on, give me your, get your arms out there. Just say in community, right? You know, one of the purposes of the church, which you, most of you know, is to help each other. They call it, we call it the one another's to learn and grow, just like we're doing right now. You know, friends, I, I encourage you to get in the habit of asking each other when you're in, you know, wherever you might be. So they say, what are you reading these days? What are you learning these days? 
You know, when you're in a, a study like this, or maybe even your takeaway today as you leave the service and you go have your, your Easter brunch or whatever it is that you have on your agenda, maybe you just get in the habit of saying, so what was your takeaway? What did you, what did you hear? You know, what did Pastor Mike say that, that caught your eye or your ear? What was your, what was your kind of your, 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 you know, your aha, if you will? The women in our Bible study here, our story, they personalize the implications of what Jesus' resurrection could mean for them individually. But then we're told that they, they shared it corporately, right? To their credit, these women, Mary Magdalene, who her story, if you read the Bible, God had delivered, Jesus had delivered seven demons from her. She was, had been possessed. Joanna was a businesswoman in the community, so she, her role probably many, you know, historians think that she probably helped kind of fund Jesus's ministry, helped, you know, undergird the financial, you know, costs of, of what his itinerant ministry would look like. She was there. Mary, we're told, the mother of James and several others. They all grasped what they had discovered had profound implications for every Christ follower, and so they did what you and I would be wise to emulate. They shared their discovery with their church family community. And then together, they, they sort of process what, what could this mean, Jesus' empty tomb? What could this mean? These angels have this encounter of he is risen. You know, on a side note, tomorrow, for those of you who have some time this week, uh, we're going to gut our church offices if you've been over to our church office, it's just outside the building here, the auditorium. It really consists of four small spaces. There's this little lobby area that you come in. There's Beto's office. And then next to that is kind of this direction is the podcast kitchen area, studio area. And then next to that is, is my office. And there's just four small kind of spaces. And tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we're going to gut the place, with the exception of my office, because it's if you go in my office, it's like going back to the 70s, so we don't want to lose the 70s, you know, retro. But the other three spaces, we're going to gut. We're going to tear down the walls. We're going to raise the ceiling up to the, to the roof because we need a place, and we're going to create a place where we can have this larger space for community. You know, one of the things that I hope and, and, and dream about when we talk about how could we use this, this, this larger area is we want to have a space where the band can comfortably practice together. We want to have a space where we can have maybe midweek youth activities. You know, most of us have heard how Joseph just got accepted to go to Pacifica, and he's a high school, and he's going to be on the worship team. And I told David already, I said, get ready, bro, because if Joseph's on this, this, this worship team, and you're one of the best bass players, by the way, he doesn't play bass, but he's one of the best plays, bass players probably in California, if not United States. He, he, this, uh, you realize how good of a uh, musician David Barrera is? He's like, He's all-star. I said, get ready, David, because if Joseph's on the, on the worship team, there's going to be, there's a chances are good that there's going to be youth who are going to want to get some music lessons. So let's create a space as we think about tearing down these walls and creating this environment. Let's create a space where if you want to have music lessons, we can do that, right? I want to create a space that has a nice environment with couches and, 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 and chairs so that if we want to, after the service, go and, and sit around with our cup of coffee or a, a Danish or something and say, hey, so what did you hear today? What was your takeaway today? We have that space. We want to have a space where we continue to grow and flourish our, our podcast ministry, which is amazing. There's people that come in every single day, or not every day, but getting close to that, who are saying, hey, can we use your studio? Can we, Beto, can you help us get our message about Jesus out? You know, Beto's doing podcasts with these guys who, who interview UFC fighters. Any, anybody into fighting? You know, there's guys who come in and talk about golf. There's people there were there yesterday. There were a group of women who were here. It's just this young teenage girl. And I'm, they're in my, I, I listen to these conversations, you know, and they're just talking about their faith in Jesus and, and talking to their peers in high school. And it, it's this amazing ministry that we have. And so this space is going to be used in so many different ways. Why is that important? What's the purpose of all that? It's because Christians personalize. We grow personally, but we also grow through small group fellowship. It's an important component for ministry. 
And so I, sh I share that with you as if you have some time this week and you want to uh, do some construction, we'll have, you know, masks for you to wear because it's going to be dusty. And uh, we've got, a, we want to put these the wall boards kind of on the, on the wall. So there's going to be some painting involved with this kind of this, uh, not paint, but we want to cover it and stuff. Please come out if you want to throw an extra buck or two in the offering bag. Know that that money is going to be used to, you know, help for some nice comfortable couch for, for you to sit on maybe when we gather together. All that to say is why. We see this model here in our Easter Bible story, how spiritual growth is fostered in what? In community. So look at verse 11. Let's keep reading. So these women, they have this amazing experience. They, they, the Bible says they go back to tell the apostles what had happened. And verse 11 says the story sounded like nonsense to the men so they didn't believe it. I used to go, full disclosure, when I came out of seminary, I could read Greek pretty well, and I knew, could read the Greek Bible, which is what the original language was written in, in the New Testament. But if you don't use it, you, what happens? You lose it. So my ability to read Greek is really, uh, uh, we would call it um, minimal. I was, gonna look, I was looking for a Spanish word, but uh, uh, un poquito. Gracias. <clears throat> Muy poquito. But if you, I do know a little bit. And if you look at, at, the, at this, this verse, verse 11 in, in Greek, it's, it's the same terminology that you might read in a Greek medical journal. When they're describing the babbling of someone who has an insane mind. So when we read this in the English translation, it, we, it loses something. But what we're told here in the Greek language is that the disciples think these women have lost their minds. They're babbling like some insane woman. They're crazy. But to Peter's credit, what was his reaction? Do you know? Look at the next verse, verse 12. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and he saw the empty linen wrappings. wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Peter, we're told, did what? He ran to the tomb to look. Why, brothers and sisters, why did Peter run to the tomb to look? Go back a couple of chapters to Luke chapter 22. If you go back just a couple of chapters to Luke chapter 22, you'll read about a, the last meal that Jesus had with his boys, his 12 disciples, before he went to the cross. And he told them, he said, guys, I'm going to go to the cross. The Passover is going to take on a new meaning. We talked about this last week. I'm going to give up my life for the sins of humanity. I'm going to rise from the grave. But before I do... Peter, you're going you're gonna to have a failure. You're going to have a moral failure, if you will. You're going to deny that you know, knew me three times. So look at verse 31, Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Let's just read this. Simon, Simon, Jesus is talking here. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus said, Peter, you're going to fail. It's coming. But when you do, not if you do, but when you do, go turn back, strengthen your brothers. So Peter does what you and I may have done. He says, Peter, Jesus, Peter says, verse 33, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you out to preach the good news, you didn't have money. And he goes on. He says, but Peter, you're going you're gonna to do the dirty deed. You know, we're told here about the devil in verse 31. And the devil, we're told, is actively seeking to destroy our lives. But what are we told to do to combat the devil? What are we told that Jesus did for Peter? Jesus was doing what? He says, I'm, I'm praying for you, Peter. Church, did you know that when you pray for people, you are offering sort of a protective lid over their lives? 
Now, it doesn't keep them from sinning, as we see here in Peter's case, because we still all have the individual choice whether we're going to choose right or wrong, correct? But when you pray for somebody, when I pray for somebody, I think we can argue that prayer can minimize the carnage. Are you praying for those people in your relational circles? Are you praying for me? I want us to take a moment right now in this conversation to pray for the people in our world who we care about, okay? So put everything down for a second. Again, put your palms open if you want, if you could feel comfortable doing that. Take a deep breath. Everybody breathe in. Exhale. Now in your heart, say, Jesus, in this moment, I lift up to you. And then you fill in the blank. Could be a son, could be a daughter, could be a girlfriend, could be a neighbor, could be a parent, co-worker. Say, Jesus, in this moment, I lift up to you. You fill in the blank. And then say, please protect them from the devil's attacks. Think about the person sitting next to you. Who'd you come in with today? Say, Jesus, please protect this person. Call them out by name in your mind from the devil's attacks. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 54. So they arrested Jesus. So Jesus has his dinner. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He gets arrested by, you know, the, the, the Roman ruling uh, leaders along with the high priests of, of the Jewish nation. And they arrest him and they lead him to the high priest's home. And Peter, we're told, follows at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard. Picture this in your mind, scene in your mind. And they sat around it and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted this must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter and suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Friends, I propose based upon Peter's experience is that that's why he ran to the empty tomb. Because if Jesus knew, if Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him, you know how you can tell whether a, a person is a false prophet or not? A false prophet is, is when you say something and it doesn't happen, then you're a false prophet. But if I predict something that's going to become true and it happens in Jesus' day, that's how you knew what the good, the, the good prophets were from the bad prophets. And so Peter had been raised in this environment, knew well, if Jesus had proven, he said he was going to, you know, such and such was going to happen. He had predicted that I was going to deny him three times. And I did. Then maybe what he said about him dying on the cross, which happened, and him raising from the grave, maybe that would be a possibility too. And so he ran. Maybe what Jesus said about defeating sin and death by raising from the grave could be a reality too. And so he ran. And I love what Jesus told Peter in verse 32. He said, Peter, even though you're going to sin, even though you're going to fall, even though you're going to deny me, he says, I want you to repent. I want you to pick yourself up. I want you to return to me so that you can strengthen your brothers, right? Because they're going to need you too. Now, don't miss this. Let Jesus' words sink into your own soul today. You know, what is so refreshing about the Easter gospel message is that even after we sin and fail, Jesus still loves us. Jesus still forgives us. Jesus doesn't give up on you when you fall. 
Rather, he invites us to keep moving forward. That's the beauty of the empty tomb. That's the message of the cross, right? He forgives us. He doesn't want us, to, he wants us to take ownership for, for our sin, but he doesn't want us to live there. He says, repent. And with God's help, keep growing. With God's help, keep improving. That's why Peter ran to the tomb. And in so doing, Peter models for us point number three, which is that legacy Christians pivot and grow. Legacy Christians pivot and grow. Friends, Jesus called it. Jesus told Peter that he was going to betray him, but Peter, Jesus also challenged Peter to grow from his failure. Repent, Jesus encouraged, and then help others do the same. You know, one of the truths that we talk about all the time around here at Palm Harvest Church is that our failures can serve as a relatable segue for people. God never wastes an experience. You know, Leon Morris once wrote, he said, he who has been through deep waters has the experience that enables him to be of help to others. He who has been through deep waters has the experience to help others face the same. Have you had a marriage that didn't go so well? Maybe an ended a divorce? Guess what? You can relate to people who are walking that same challenge. You ever had a health issue that maybe you struggled with? And God, are you there? God, are you there? God, are you there? And now suddenly you, you learn something, you grow something. Guess what? Now you have a greater capacity to walk with people who are facing a medical challenge. Legacy Christians pivot and they grow. And so let's say another prayer together, okay? Take a deep breath. Maybe it's been a while since you've, you know, been in a service like this and maybe you're feeling a little guilty. I don't know. Maybe you did something this past week that when you think about it, you go, you know what? I wish I wouldn't have done that or I wish I wouldn't have said that. Or maybe there's just this nagging thing that, you know, you just feel really bad about. Let's just go to the Lord today. And in your heart, Say, Jesus, please forgive me. Please forgive my, me for my sin. And if there's something specific, just, just call it out. Please forgive me. And then say, please use me to help others grow from my mistake. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Friends, faith is not the absence of sin in our life. Faith is not the absence of falling prey to the devil's attacks. Faith is repenting and returning to Jesus after we sin. You know, Jesus knows that because of the devil's activity that we are prone to sin, you know, he tells us here earlier in Luke chapter 22, where we read, he says that the devil wants all of you. I'm not sure quite the interaction that the devil has and the access the devil has to God. There's some, some, some scriptures that kind of um, tell us that, that, that he has uh, ability to go into God's heavenly court. And there's these conversations that take place. So Jesus recognizes that the devil is, is, is after you and me, but we also need to know that Jesus is praying for us. And so that in those accounts that, that we fall and we sin, we, Jesus says, get up. Return to me. Ask for forgiveness. Get up, return to me. And then he says, strengthen those around you. Legacy Christians pivot and grow. And then point number four, our last point, and we're going to land the plane here. Legacy Christians strengthen others. The Christian life is the life of strengthening others. Legacy Christians strengthen others. Jesus had predicted that Peter would fail. And he challenged Peter to repent when the time came and not allow his failure to define him. Now personalize this. Do all... Are any of you, do you, any of you feel like you've been defined by a past mistake or failure? 
Jesus is in the business of transforming people's lives. Amen? That's the message of the empty tomb, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. And with his resurrection, for those of us who put our faith in Jesus, arises this opportunity for us to become Jesus' ambassador, dirt and all. Jesus wants you, he wants me to be someone, his hands and feet, to strengthen others. To build up the band of brothers. And I'm suggesting that Jesus' invitation to Peter is one that he offers to you and me as well. Legacy Christians strengthen who? Others. I'll close with this. This past week I got an email from uh, uh, someone who used to work in our city ironically. Uh, and this person uh, just sent this long email and, and said, hey, I, I just want to let you know that you're on my mind. And this is what he wrote. Let me just read a portion of what he wrote. I think it really reinforces the truth of this fourth point. He writes, hello, Pastor Mike. I'm praying for you frequently this week. Last night I read John chapter 12 and I thought of you. In John chapter 12, Jesus is talking about walking in the light. That's the, that's the context. I went back and read it. And he says, walk in the light because before the darkness overtakes you. He writes this. He says, I encourage you to take every thought captive and only to let it take root if it's from Jesus. He says, keep looking into his eyes. Keep trusting him. He is with you. You are his son. His love surrounds you. He will never forsake you. So my friend was sensing like, Mike's, gonna, Mike's in a battle, right? He, he, remember I was talking about respond to the nudge when God brings somebody to your mind, that, you know, send him a text and say, hey, I'm just thinking about you right now, right? So he's responding to the nudge and he's saying, Mike, I'm reading this and I feel like maybe, you know, the devil's going to attack you. He says, walk only in the light this week. He is risen. I thank God for you and all that you do. Powerful email. It's an admonition from a brother in the Lord to stay strong that though the devil might be attacking, his, this brother wanted me to know that I'm not alone. This brother wanted me to know that he was praying for me just as Peter prayed for Jesus. You know, if you're here today or you're tuning in online, we want you to know that you're not alone. Yes, that's the purpose of the church. For us to walk with each other even when we fail or even after when we fail. To help each other get up. And so if you're here and you feel like you're alone or you're watching online and you feel like you're alone, please know that you're not because we are your family. You know, for those of you who are, in fact, turn to your neighbor right now and just say, I'm with you. I'm with you. Keep growing. I'm with you. You know, for those of you tuning in online right now, just let me, let me say this. You know, after our broadcast today, if, if you've been tuning in for very long, Beto, will, who's now in the studio over here, he, he'll, he'll, he'll come online and he'll be talking directly to you. And we want those of people who are tuning in online to know that they're part of our church family too, yes? yes. And so if you're watching online and Beto asks you, you know, for your comment or emoji or a prayer request, we hope that you will give it to us because we want you to know that we our family. Legacy Christians personalize, and so we can personalize while we're sitting in here on the, our, our chairs or on our home and our couches, but we do it in community. Legacy Christians strengthen others. Friends, that's why the women ran back to the, to the tell the others. That's why Peter ran to the tomb, because Jesus' resurrection is a legacy moment that impacts all of us, yes? He is risen. And his power, his resurrection power is for you and for me. So let's say one final prayer. The band's up here. I guess it's time for me to be done. That's good. Put your palms out again. Deep breath in. Exhale. Just between you and the Lord, say this. Thank you, Jesus, for defeating sin and death. Thank you, Jesus, for proving that you have the authority to offer me a spiritual reset. 
And so please empower my heart today with your resurrection power. This is my Easter legacy prayer. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Would you please stand? Let me offer you one final blessing. Sisters and brothers. Sisters and brothers, live this week with the understanding that Jesus loves you. He is with you. And he wants to work through you and in your lives even after you and I fail. And so I bless you today with an increased capacity to experience Jesus' resurrection power in your life. I bless you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. Let's sing out. What can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus let's sing all precious and all precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood hallelujah i know it was the blood could have only been the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it was the blood. Could have only sing it again. Hallelujah. 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 I know it was the blood. Could have only been the blood. What can wash? And what can wash away? Let's sing it out. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have a good week, Palm Harvest. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Happy Easter. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.